As we ended last week's lesson, in chapter 8, we found uh, that Paul was saying to the Jews, specifically to the Jews, that there was therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And in fact, as we ended chapter 8, we had to, and we look back at the first eight chapters in the book of Rome, it is very clear that even though Paul is writing to that church in Rome, and he's writing a letter that is addressed to all those saints who are of Rome, who are both Gentiles and Jews, it is very clear now to us that the target of Paul's letter to the, Rome, to the Roman church is the Jews who are in that church. The Jews who have a belief in Jesus Christ, but just cannot let go of all their old baggage that they've brought along from their Jewish heritage uh, from all those years of being Jews. Uh, looking back at the law and trying to do every single thing that they should never do or do all the things they're supposed to do. And when I say that, uh, it seems like when God's law was written down, there are, there are things that God wants the Jews to do to be different, separate from the rest of the people in the world. And those tend to be very easy things to understand and comprehend. Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. Now, what's the big deal about that? That's pretty easy. Even though it says thou shalt not, it's pretty easy to understand God wants just him to be him. Thou shalt not have any idols. That's pretty easy to understand too. Go on down the list. Thou shalt not covet, not commit adultery, not commit murder. No problem with that. The problem came for the Jews when the heritage passed past Moses and past Joshua to get to the point where there is this Sanhedrin that's in place. I haven't said this in my, either of my other two classes, but I, I thought in the, after the last class this is kind of an important point. Most people don't realize where the Sanhedrin came from. You remember Moses is out in the wilderness for 40 years. He is the judge and jury on absolutely everything. Finally, uh, one day, his father-in-law, Jethro, comes to him and says, Moses, you can't keep being the judge and the jury over every single thing that has to be decided amongst all these people out here in the, in the, in the uh, wilderness. He said, what I suggested you do, you hear that? It's Jethro's suggestion. What I suggest that you do, Moses, is that you go to all the elders, the men, and the word elders means the natural leaders of the, each tribe. It might not specifically be the head of the tribe, although most of the time it, had, it was going to be the head of a tribe. It was the people that were the elders of each tribe that the people followed their lead. And you know how that is, folks. Even amongst this group here, where we sit here with uh, more than well, all of us that are here, and there are natural leaders in this group that when they say something, they can move this entire group in one direction or another. It's just the natural God-given leadership that they, we follow them because of their walk with God and their discernment and their wisdom and, what, <clears throat> and who they are. And then there's other peoples in this room, lots of us here that, you know, we can make our statement, but everybody's going to go, okay. Okay, there's a statement. We heard that. I never will forget in every church that I have been at, there has been a person that, at a, that he will sit back and he will not say anything in a business meeting or anything like that or a committee meeting until the very end. And actually when he speaks, he's, he'll get up and say in one or two short sentences and everybody else has been getting up and talking for 10 minutes. You know what I'm talking about. They try to enforce their position. But this person, one person, who is the natural elder of the church, will stand up and say in one or two sentences, I believe this and I am for this, and he'll sit down and they take the vote and everybody votes like he said. You know what I'm talking about. That's what uh, Jethro was recommending to Moses, that he go to the elders or the natural leaders, each of the tribes, select 70. Let them make the judgments between the little bitty things. And if anything had to come down to where it needed a a tie-breaking vote, 35 to 35, then Moses, then you make the, the tie-breaking vote. That's how the Sanhedrin got put in place. 
After Moses was gone off the scene and after Joshua was gone off the scene, the Sanhedrin began to take hold and control things. And what most people don't realize is, is between the time of after Joshua has died, over the next uh, several hundred years, <laughs> several, 1,300 years plus, the Sanhedrin lined out 613 laws that were loosely based on the Old Testament law. Did you hear that, loosely based? One of the laws was um, you couldn't work on the Sabbath. You, you don't find it in the Old Testament. You find it in the Jewish laws. It was the Jewish law, one of these 613 laws, where Jesus has his disciples out in the field, and they're going through the field, and they're hungry, and it's the Sabbath. And they go and they pull some of the grains of wheat, they crack them open, they eat the wheat. The Pharisees come along and say, you can't do that, that's working on the Sabbath. You're breaking the law of God. Of which Jesus answers them by saying, don't you feed your cattle on the Sabbath? You don't consider that work. Why, why is it wrong for my men to eat when they're hungry on the Sabbath? <clears throat> and it was, that law was one of the 613 laws that were man-made laws, Jewish man-made laws that were not God's laws. Jesus answered them with the true statement and true intent of the law, and they couldn't answer him back. Uh, you could not walk over so many, such a, such a, so and so distance on the Sabbath, or you were breaking the Jewish law. Was it God's law? No, it was one of the Sanhedrin 613 laws. And they had all these laws in place so much that a good Jew could probably keep all of the laws of God to the best of their ability, but they couldn't help but break one of these laws. Just couldn't help it because they were so restrictive. I get to thinking about that today. Now, I hope I, hope I don't disturb some of y'all, but um, I think about our Texas legislation. They're up there every single day, uh, one, and they're making all these laws. And most of us never hear about them. In fact, there was a law that was changed. I heard from Robert Talton because he was there whenever he, um, when they passed the law. And I heard it out of his lips, what he explained to me they had passed. And so I went to three of our other attorneys and asked them a question. I guess I was being a little deceptive to see if they knew the new law. They didn't know the new law. They were still practicing as if it was under the old way instead of the new way. I think about our guys up in Washington passing this and that, this and that. The only time it bothers us is when we get caught in its fire, in the crosshairs of it, and we find out after the fact. Most of us, they're, they're doing stuff all the time, folks. All the time. They are changing our laws all the time. It is like the Sanhedrin, making up laws for this and making up laws for that. And the sad part about it is, is most of them are knee-jerk reactions. Reacting, knee-jerk reactions instead of really planning. Well, Paul is endeavoring to straighten out these Jews who are in the church here. He's trying to straighten them out and get them to understand that they need to let go of all this stuff and they need to also let go of the Old Testament law because they are now living under the grace of God. The old laws never led anyone to salvation. They only, it only directed them to know that they were sinners. However, even in the Old Testament, there still is the Word of God that leads them to look forward to the Messiah who is to come. And for all those people who are of Jewish descent or any descent, Jew or Gentile, who look towards the future, the, the future Messiah, the Creator of this earth, for Him to be God of God and Lord of Lords, they were seen to be righteous by God. For those of us who are since Jesus Christ, we look back to the Messiah we're looking at the same spot, folks. Before Calvary and after Calvary, we look to the same spot and we look to the same person. Before they were looking to the Messiah who is to come, we are looking at the Messiah who came. Same spot, same person, same Savior. So, Paul is concerned. And in fact, in chapter 9, he is going to expand his target to not only getting these Jews corrected, but he wishes for something. He wishes not only for these Jews, but he wishes for all the Jews who have not ever accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. 
For these Jews there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Gentiles are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. There's no condemnation, meaning that, yes, you're going to sin. Yes. But nothing can take you out of the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is sealing you uh, as your witness, bearing witness with you that you belong to Him. Romans chapter 9, verse 1. Uh, with that in mind, he says, I am telling you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bearing with me witness in the, in the Holy Spirit. Sorry, my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. That I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. Here we are. Folks, the Holy Spirit resides inside of you. I want you to catch something. When you were born, the little man that you are, or a woman, well, that went bad. Okay? You have inside of you, you have your body. You have the Spirit of God that makes you alive and animated. That's, that keeps your heart ticking. The Spirit of God. The Spirit of God keeps everything alive, by the way. Every amoeba, every roach, every ant, every leaf. Everything that's in this world that is alive is alive because of the breath of God, the Spirit of God that gives life is in you. Then you have your soul. That is who you are. That is your conscience. That's who you are and who, what makes up your personality. It is your soul that needs to be saved, folks. You got it? Your spirit belongs to God. Whenever the spirit leaves you, that spirit that keeps you alive and inanimate goes back to God because it belongs to God. It's the breath of life. Spirit's the breath of life. Whenever you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior by putting your belief in Him, this is incredible. God puts inside of you a down payment of the future. It's the Holy Spirit. So whenever you make a decision to sin, after you have Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have just made a decision to take one-third of the Godhead into that sin with you. Is that an awesome thought? Awesome. That you who are believers have been given a down payment inside of you of allowing the Holy Spirit to dwell inside of you. Now, a lost person doesn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of him. That's what Paul talked about at the end of last week's lesson when he says that the Holy Spirit bears witness for those who are, belong to God. Your witness can say all day long, you can say, my, your soul, your soul can bear witness and say, hey, I belong to God. But when you die, you don't go to heaven, you go to torment. And on the judgment day, you go, you go before the great white throne judgment and you say to God, Lord, I worked at the church for 30 years. I was in Sunday school every single Sunday. I mean, the day I was born, the next day was Sunday, and I went to church on a pillar, which I did. <laughs> okay? This is my story here. I mean, my mother, Nick, I guess it was three days later, but she had me at church sit, laying on a pillar uh, there in Marlow, Oklahoma, laying on a pillar in church at First Baptist Church, Marlow, Oklahoma. And I got a perfect attendance of wards. At up till age 15, because since birth, I did not miss a single Sunday. Till I was, after I was 15, they stopped giving it after 15 for some reason. But I would have gotten it on up to 18. I probably would have. It, it, anyway, it, you know, you can say, Lord, I was there. I called you Lord. Did you see all the things I did for you? I fed all those poor. I did all this other stuff. And Lord's going to look at somebody and say that, that, say that to him and say, depart from me, I never knew you. The reason is, is you did all of that by yourself, but you never believed in me and allowed the Holy Spirit to come inside of you and dwell inside of you. Because if the Holy Spirit doesn't bear witness with you that says you belong, because the Holy Spirit's reading your heart. See, not everybody does things because of the heart, with their heart. They do things out of some sort of compulsion that it's the right thing to do, but they don't do it because of the right reason, because it's for God. And they don't believe in God for the right reasons. In fact, they don't believe in God at all. They just do it because it's the thing they've been taught to do. So the Holy Spirit's have to bear witness. Paul is saying, My, the Holy Spirit's bearing witness with me about how I feel about what I'm fixing to tell you. Verse 2, that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. The Holy Spirit's saying, yes, his heart has grief. His heart is unceasingly grieving what he's about to tell us. Verse 3, this is an awesome, an awesome that he is saying here and could be 
drastic if it wasn't for the grace of God. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Remember I told you last week and the week before, anytime you see the word brethren in the Scripture, any place in the New Testament, it's always referring to Jews. Here we actually understand why. His kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belong the adoption of sons, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the temple service, and the promise whose are the fathers, and from whom is Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, blessed forevermore. Amen. He's saying, I wished, and I would do this, Paul is saying, I would do this. I would be accursed and eternally out of the presence of God if every one of my Jewish kinsmen, all my Israelite brothers and sisters, and cousins and, and uncles and aunts, would come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. If the whole nation of Israel would come to believe in God, I would be willing, Paul says, to reject my salvation and spend eternity in torment. Of course, it can't happen because the Holy Spirit's your down payment. It can't happen. Paul can't. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing once you belong to Him. Nothing. That's just been said in chapter 8. So that's the reason why he's saying this here. He's saying, look, I would do that for my brethren. I would do that if they would. Why? Because they had every reason to accept the Messiah is going to come. They had every reason because it was the Jews were the first to have the opportunity to be adopted as sons of God. We dealt with that last week. Sons of God, they could get in this adoption process of putting their faith in the Messiah who is to come. And, and they could be part of that adoption process. And they were the first to be given the law and given the temple services and, and be given the promises that came from Adam, I mean from Abraham, that Abraham would be the father of many nations and out of him would come uh, the, 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 the Savior of the world. They, they could be part of the blessings of Abraham. And yet most of the Israelites, even in Paul's day, are missing the mark. They're missing the mark. They don't accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior. In this, if you remember back in Romans 8, the last couple of verses, there in Romans uh, chapter 8, uh, Romans, Paul quotes that familiar verse where he says, but for the sake we are, are killed all day long. For thy sake uh, we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And he's still referring to that when he's talking about, hey, the Jews are out here. We're just like sheep we're going to be slaughtered. We're not looking to the Messiah. We're not accepting the Messiah. Our, the brethren as a whole are not looking to, to God. Uh, they're out doing their own thing. They're doing their own works. They're, they're keeping the 613 laws, but they're not doing what God has done. They're not accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Verse 6. But it is not as though the Word of God has failed. <laughs> the Word of God, the oracles of God, came to the Jews and showed them God's will. And they still haven't accepted God's will as a whole. But the word of God has not failed. No, it has not. For they are not all Israel who are descendants from Israel. Neither are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are regarded as descendants. Paul is quoting from Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21 is where Paul is quoting from. Paul quotes in the book of Romans more text from the Old Testament than any other book quotes from the Old Testament text. That text is a promise. Actually, God is consoling Abraham. Uh, Sarah has, has had a child by the name of Isaac. And Sarah says this, it says, Now Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, and she had born to Abraham mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, Drive out this maiden and her son, for the son of this maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. And the matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son. Abraham loved Ishmael. He loved Ishmael. Ishmael was his son. But God said to Abraham, you catch that? God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her. For through Isaac your descendants shall be named. What's going on here? What's going on? Let me give you the genealogy real quick. Abraham is over in the, 
in the land that the Lord has sojourned him to. And there he gives Abraham a promise and a covenant that he's going to have a child. <laughs> well, he's married to Sarah. Sarah is old. Abraham is old. And he gives this promise to Abraham. Sarah hurries up and doesn't wait on God. Sarah says to Abraham, My Egyptian handmaid, who was very young and still in childbearing years, belonged to Sarah. This meant that they had money, folks. They were not poor. Okay, They had money. Sarah says to Abraham, Well, since I am so old that I am, why don't you take Hagar, my maid, because she belongs to me, so she's part of me, and have a child with her. Abraham, yep, you got the rest of the story. He did. And he has this child by the name of Ishmael. And he loves Ishmael. And everything is okay between Abraham and Hagar and Sarah and Ishmael until, <laughs> verse 9, Paul carries on the rest of the story. For this is a word of promise. At this time I will come... <laughs> And Sarah will have a son. <laughs> That's in Genesis chapter 18. So Paul does this interesting thing. He's in Genesis chapter 21. Then he backs up to, tell, to catch up on the story in Genesis chapter 18. And there in Genesis chapter 18, verse 10, it says, And he said, I will the Lord says, I shall surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door which was behind him. <laughs> Sarah is almost 90 years old, and I don't care who you are, that is past the childbearing years. Don't you think? <laughs> Hallelujah for some of you. <laughs> One year later, when she's 90, she has Isaac. Verse chapter 21, Isaac's shown up, and all of a sudden, now we got problems. She is jealous of this child. And the handmaiden. And she's the one that started it. She's the one that jumped ahead. Well, Abraham, God says to Abraham, don't be distressed. Don't worry. Through Isaac, your son, as promised, through Isaac, your son, he will, I will name those who belong to you. Who belong to the descendants of Abraham. He's fulfilling the promise of Abraham. Okay, let's go on with the genealogy. Ishmael will go on to have 12 sons and grandsons in the midst of the grandsons and the next generation of grandsons, or sons and grandsons, there'll be 12 boys. Isaac will go on to have two boys, Jacob and Esau. Esau, they're both conceived at the same time. Esau comes out first. Jacob comes out holding the heel of his brother. Second, Jacob is a scoundrel. Any way you look at it, any way you look at it, Jacob is a scoundrel. Go back in all your Old Testament passages that deal with Ishmael the man and Esau the man, and you will not find one single bad thing about Ishmael or Esau. They are upright men. They are good men. Abraham loves Ishmael. Abraham loves Esau. Isaac loves Esau. They are great boys. Esau ends up having 12 sons. Jacob ends up having 12 sons. The 12 sons of Esau, uh, some of them are born to him, by, um, 12 sons, some of them are born to him from, he takes his first wife, who, or his third wife, I'm sorry, is the daughter of Ishmael. So these 12 sons and these 12 sons and grandsons all have a common lineage between Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael. Got it? These twelve on each side become the twelve dukes. And every descendant from these twelve tribes, of these twelve dukes, of these two men, are called the Arab tribes, even today. Now let's say you're Persian. Persian? No. You see, Abraham is a descendant of Shem off of the boat, off of the ark. But the Persians are a different line than Abraham, not the same line. So they're Persian. They're not part of it. However, by the time of um, Jesus' day, after the Assyrian captivity, and after the Babylonian captivity, 
and after the overrun with Greeks and then the Roman world, some of these Arabs have actually married in and this, the blood is just going all different direction. So that in reality of all that area out there, even into some of the Egyptian areas, well, they all got the blood of Abraham running through them because of the descendants of the sons of Ishmael and the sons of Esau. Well, Jacob has 12 sons also. And one of those sons is named Judah, and out of the line of Judah comes Jesus Christ, the Messiah. It is through the line of Isaac, through Isaac, that Jesus comes, who is the one who will say to everyone, this person belongs to Christ, this person belongs to Christ, this person belongs, and therefore they are in the blessing of Abraham. That's what, that's what the point that Paul is trying to make here. Verse 10, And all only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, for, through, for though the twins were not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad, because they have been in the womb, um, in order that God's purpose, according to his choice, might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, uh, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, uh, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now I want you to understand, Paul is making the point that this is for God's purpose. He, God is doing this to show that He is God. God is doing this to show that all things work took for good to those who love God and who are called according to His purpose. From chapter 8, we've got to keep the context going here. It all fits together. Rebecca, Rebecca is Jacob's, I mean is, is Isaac's wife. She has Esau, she has Jacob. Jacob is a scoundrel, and in fact the name Jacob means deceiver. His brother Esau is out one day and he's starving. And Jacob has some food. And, and Esau asks for food. And Jacob says, yeah, I'll give it to you if you'll sell me your birthright. That's a scoundrel. This is his brother. Got it? Well, Jacob does a series of things that is against Esau. He is a dog, okay? Finally he has to run because he's afraid that Esau is going to hurt him. He ends up out with a little lady and he ends up out with a man and his daughters and one of his daughters he takes a liking to. And so he goes to the father Laban, the father of this daughter, Rachel, and he says, Laban, I would like to have Rachel, your daughter, as my wife. What must I do for you? So he strikes a deal to work for seven years. And after the seven years happens, they have the marriage ceremony and Jacob goes to the, uh, uh, the bridal, uh, bride marital chamber to open his packages. Can I say it that way? And lo and behold, his packages is not what he worked for. The deceiver had been deceived. He's got the older daughter. He's got the, the one he didn't want. So he goes back to the deceiver who deceived him and says, what can I do to get your daughter Rachel? He says, work for me another seven years. So he does. Finally he gets Rachel. It takes him 14 years to get Rachel. Then he knows what father-in-law is like. And he's building his herd and his father-in-law's herd and he separates out the different herd so they can do all this stuff and he makes a deal and before, whenever, whenever it comes time for him to leave, after 21 years, 21 years of working for Laban, the father-in-law, he gets his stuff, he packs up his two wives and out he goes. He's out of there. Boom. He's gone with the other wives that are going on too. The whole clan gets out of there with his cattle and everything that he has acquired from Laban, his father-in-law, but his father-in-law was fixing to deceive him again, if you remember. He learned his lesson. Finally, he was out laying underneath the stars one night with a rock for a pillow underneath his head. I prefer something a little softer than a pillow, than the rock. He sees a ladder coming down from heaven and an angel. And he begins to wrestle with that angel all night long. He wrestles with him and he holds on to him. He held on to his brother coming out of the womb. And his brother ended up serving him the rest of his life. He holds on to that angel and says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And the angel says, okay, I'll bless you. So he blesses him, gives him a blessing. 
But if you remember, when it was all said and done, and he wake up and he gets up the next morning, he's going to be blessed. His name is going to be changed from the deceiver to the name Israel. He's going to, that's going to be his new name. But his hip is out of socket for the rest of his life. Now, for those of you fixing to have hip surgery in this room, you're blessed to be able to do that because he had to re live the rest of his life with his hip out of socket, never be fixed, always to be in pain, always to know with a constant, painful, physical reminder that God is God. And it's God who does the blessing. And it's God who's in control. And God will do what He wants as He wills for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. <laughs> so, Paul quotes out of, <laughs> look at here, he skips ahead and he quotes <clears throat> out of Genesis 25 to talk about the story of the older shall serve the younger. But he also skips to the end of the book to Malachi. Huh. To Malachi. Well, Abraham is about 1990 B.C. Jacob is born in 1885 B.C., the sons, so it's after that. Malachi is written in 404 B.C., so 1,400 years later, the book of Malachi, when he quotes it, and he says in Malachi 1, 1 through 3, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, How hast thou loved me? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau, and I have made his mountain a desolation, and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. <clears throat> From the time Esau is born, he is a godly man and a righteous man, and so is Ishmael. But his twelve sons... And the twelve sons and grandsons here, and all of their descendants, by the time 404 B.C. comes around, they are horrible people who God does not like what they've done. Moses is out there in the wilderness. They've spent 40 years. They're fixing to cross. They want to go around the Dead Sea on the west side of the Dead Sea. They want to go up and they want to go across the Jordan River. In order to do that, they want to go over their cousin's land, the Edomites. One of the sons of Esau's name was Timon. All of Timon's descendants that have the blood of Timon in them, is called, they are called the Edomites. The Edomites answer back to Moses' request to cross over their land with a very firm and positive, affectionate no. You may not bring your folks across our land. They're cousins. They're blood. They ought to allow them to do it. Moses, being the wonderful, godly person that he was, he loaded up his 613,000 men who were uh, 20 years of age and younger of fighting capability and warriors plus all the aunts and uncles and moms and dads and children and kids and, and cats and rats and elephants and all that goes along with that and the carts. And Moses takes them on a journey right through the middle of Edom. Right across the dead middle of it in the middle of the day. They don't sneak through. Just right there. There they go. They make their turn. He touches his toe into the Jordan River and they cross over in the Promised Land on dry ground. Everybody knows about the Red Sea coming part, but they never, people don't realize he, he parted the Jordan River too. You know, if God can part the Red Sea, the Jordan River is a snap. Look at here. Malachi. By the time of Malachi, 1,400 years later. You see, God was looking, not looking ahead of time because God is omnipotent. He knew that the sons of Esau would become detestable. He knew the sons of Ishmael would become detestable. He also knew that the sons of Jacob would become his people, but there would also be a bit of problem with them too. He'd have to deal with that. Let's go on to the next verse. <clears throat> verse 14. But what shall we say then? There is no justice, injustice with God? <laughs> is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So that it is not, then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Let me teach you something about Bible study here. As you go through and do Bible, do Bible study, especially if you're using the New American Standard or any of the new translations, when they put stuff in, in caps like this, you need to go back to where that was found and go read the context of that story. Because the context of that story in the Old Testament setting will tell you what's going on in the New Testament setting. 
If you don't go back there, you can get all sorts of theology out of this that just doesn't fit the package. So you have to go see what the theology is back in the Old Testament and bring it forward. And that's what I've been doing for y'all with all these Old Testament passages. This is taken after the, out of the book of Exodus, chapter 33. It's God's Word. He says, and, and here's what it says. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and show compassion to whom I will show compassion. But here's the context of this verse. Paul is quoting it, but what's the context? Moses is up on the mountain, Mount Sinai, for the second time. Not the first time, but the second time. The first time he'd gone up, God had carved out two tablets of stone and had engraved them. God did it with his finger. Moses is carrying them down. He gets down and he hears all the stuff hoopla going on in the camp down at the bottom of the mountain. He looks over, there's a huge golden calf down there. And the descendants of one of the line of people called the descendants of Korah. Now you've heard me talk about this before. The three prime evil sins in this world, and every sin falls into one of these categories, is the sin of lust of the eye, lust of the uh, flesh, or the pride of life. Now, coupled with those three, they also say it a different way. The error of Balaam, the way of Korah, and the way of Cain. Each one of those are stories about either the lust of the flesh, or the lust of the eye, or the pride of life. All sins fall in that category. Whenever Abra, uh, Moses comes down off the mountain with those tablets, he sees Korah has led the people into detestable degradation, and they are having a party-hardy time down there that is against God in every way, form, or fashion. Moses gets mad. He throws the tablets down. Where the tablets hit, an earthquake opens up. Earthquake opens up, in goes the golden calf, in goes all those the descendants of Korah. They all fall into the hole and the, war, and the earth closes back up on them. Now the problem is, is Moses doesn't have the Ten Commandments written by God anymore. So he goes back up on the mountain to get them again. He gets up there and in the context of this passage, God says, you know, I'll tell you what, I'm going to have compassion on you and I'm going to have grace on you for what you did. You destroyed the tablets when you threw them in. I'm going to rewrite the tablets. However, you've got to cut the stones out by hand. So get at it, Moses. God's got a penalty. Got it? And he's going to do what he's going to do. So Moses cuts out the tablets this time, and God engraves them. Got them? And he'll bring them back. They'll be the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. No idols. Um, no adultery. No um, covenants. No killing. All that. God has mercy on whom he has mercy. He will do what he will do for the good of his people. Well, let's just prove that a little more. Chapter, uh, verse 17 says, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. Now this is a verse, I should have put it in here actually where this context comes from. It comes back from Exodus. Pharaoh. If you remember our Luke study, I gave to you the picture of this Pharaoh. In fact, I gave you the picture of the mummy of this Pharaoh and his daddy, and the picture of his grandfather. Uh, the three pharaohs in line that met and dealt with Moses, pulled him out of the bull, uh, allowed him to be pulled out of the bulrush and to live, and the following pharaoh, and then this pharaoh who's in charge whenever Moses comes back and says, let my people go from God. You know, proclaiming God's word, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, yeah, yeah, I hear you. No, I'm not going to let your people go. Finally, Pharaoh says to Moses, this third Pharaoh, he says, I tell you what, I'm not going to let your people go. In fact, I am so tired of you asking that I'm going to kill the firstborn of every one of your children. And sure enough, Moses goes back and says, oh no, this is not good. So they have blood put on the doorpost of every person that belongs to the Lord, of Jewish descent, whatever. The death angel comes over, even the Pharaoh's firstborn son dies. Pharaoh is fed up to it from here and he says, get your people Get out of here, go past Park Avenue, Boardwalk, do not pass go, do not collect $200, just get your people out of here. And on April the 15th of 1445 B.C., they walked out of Egypt, a free people. The problem is, is they left Egypt, but they didn't have Egypt out of them yet. Because you notice they don't get very far 
and then they start yearning, going, oh, Lord, you know, here we are eating all this stuff that's on the ground. We could have been back in Egypt. They were feeding us. They, they're not grateful. Well, the context is this. Pharaoh decides, what did I do that for? Why in the world did I do that? So he takes his army, he chases after them. They are down to the Red Sea. Moses sees them coming. He turns around, parts the Red Sea. Doom, do, 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 do. They all march on through. Pharaoh goes, follow them. So off they go. Mm, through. They go through. The sea covers up on Pharaoh's folks and kills them all. And Pharaoh backs up and says, truly, the God of Moses is the God of gods. That Pharaoh's son will be the next Pharaoh who comes along and says, there is only one true God and he bans all the other gods in Egypt. Only for his son to come back and go, my father must have had Alzheimer's. Because we need these other gods. And he brings those other gods back in. But the son of this Pharaoh has learned what his father learned and bans all the gods. That's the rest of the story. And at that point in time, this Pharaoh was the powerhouse in all the known world. And this Pharaoh allowed the known world to know that the God of Abraham and the God of Moses was the God of gods and the Lord of lords, fulfilling that passage of Scripture. Verse 18. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Will you say then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does, it, does not the potter have the right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable uses and another vessel for common uses? In other words, you say, look, he made Pharaoh. He made him out of a lump of clay. And he used Pharaoh for his purposes. And all that stuff that was going on was for the purpose of bringing good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. But out of the same lump... Just like the Jews and the Gentiles made out of the same lump of clay, God can use some for this purpose and some for that purpose. He chose to use the Jews to be God's people through which Jesus would come through the lineage of Isaac to, bless, to fulfill the blessings and the promise of the covenant to Abraham. God can do as He wishes, what He wishes, and be gracious to who He is gracious to and, and um, have mercy upon who He has mercy. Out of the same lump of clay, a potter. Yes, sir, Jim. Doesn't it point to the sovereignty of God? Mm, yes, it points. Everything is pointing to the sovereignty of God. Yes, but let me go to a different point. The different point is this. A potter has control over the clay. A potter takes a spinning wheel and he takes a lump of clay and he puts it on that, on that, lump, on that spinning wheel. And there on that spinning wheel, he designs out and takes away clay until he has this beautiful vessel. It is baked and it ends up going to the temple to have the water in it that is poured for the priest for honorable uses. He's got the clay that's left. And now that clay that's left, he forms another, another pot. This pot, let's say, is a chamber pot. Do any of y'all know what a chamber pot is? How many of y'all know what a chamber pot is? Okay, let's ask you another question. How many of you do not know what a chamber pot is? Brave souls, good. All right. Well, a, and I'm going to explain it. Can you believe a chamber pot is a pot that you take in beside your bed at night so that you don't have to run to the house out in the yard that has a moon shape in it called the outhouse. It is a pot that you use. Now look, folks, I want you to talk about something. I want you to understand something here. I understand. It came from the same clay. And the potter chose one for one use and one for the other. But neither of those two uses are bad in God's eyes because God made us, bo made us both. And made both of them. God, it, it, God made us to where we're going to drink water and then we got to do something with what we ate. You got it? God's the way God made us. However, if I was to have brought my chamber pot in here, some of you go, what do you do with that? What in the world? Have you lost your mind? You're bringing, that, that's got disease and stuff in it. Don't you know that we've got some porcelain ones that are pretty just right out there outside the door? Well, I thought I'd just bring this one in because I was going to carry it and dump it someplace. This is a common use pot. 
Now, if I was to bring in a pot here that's full of wine, I'm sorry, Baptist, grape juice, and I'm going to pour it out for us to have the Lord's Supper, you would think, oh, that's wonderful. But when you go back to the origin of where the two pots came from, they came from the same lump of clay. God will do what He does to get for the good to those who love God and called call according to His purpose for common uses, uses and for these super spiritual honorable uses. It does not matter. Just like He calls you. Sometimes we have to be doing the common uses and then we get to do the honorable uses. And we have to do the common uses and we do the honorable uses. I get to do the honorable use of standing up here on Sundays for you, but there are those other days where I'm out hauling the junk out of people's houses that are covered in cat hair, which I am horribly allergic to, and I'm itching, and I am scratching, and I've got Benadryl in my system like it's running free and trying to keep from being allergic to those cats. And, and we're going to do it again. We've got a, a pastor down in Orange, Texas, who their church has evicted them from the parsonage. He must have done something really bad. Yeah. So the DOM, the director of missions, has contacted us if we can help get them moved to San Antonio. And in the upright, righteous way, I go, absolutely. <laughs> and I said, we're going to do it one day. I'll bring the truck early in the morning. You, have it. you get packed. I'll be there. We'll pack you. And one day, we'll take it to San Antonio. And I'll come home that night. We're going to do it one day. I'm not going to do it in six days. I'm going to do it in five days. I'm not going to do it like that. I'm not going to throw it out. If it's not packed, it's not going on the truck. I'm not lifting a thing. You get other folks. I'm just the driver. Unless i got a CDL driver here in the crowd that would like to go. Do it for me, okay? I'd love to have you do that, but it's got, it takes a CDL driver. And so it's a common purpose, and then I get to come do the honorable purpose. All made out of the same lump of clay. This clay has not changed. He got, God is the one who molds us for His purpose. If I, don't want to, don't, I want to remind you back in Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, he said, But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Neither are they all children because they are Abraham's descendant. But through Isaac your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. The ones who put the same faith in God as the belief that Abraham had in the coming Messiah and in God, if you hold that same belief, you are one of his descendants. It doesn't matter if you're blood or not. It doesn't matter. Gentile or Jew, it does not matter. Verse 22, For what if God, although willing to demonstrate His wrath to make His power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? As I remember, He did. He came and He endured the punishment on the cross of vessels made from the same lump of clay, who put him on the cross. And he endured that wrath that was prepared for him. Verse 23 actually says that. And he did so. In order that he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, here he's back to this topic, but from also among the Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people my people, and her who was not my beloved beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Now he goes to Hosea. He backs up from Malachi and goes to Hosea. Hosea! instructed by God to marry a prostitute. His wife is continually, Hosea's wife is continually running to other men. She has three children, of which we don't know who the biological father is of the three children. You catch that? And yet Hosea is constantly told by God, go and get her and bring her back. She belongs to you. Go and get her and bring her back. And Hosea is constantly going to get her and bring her back. It is a picture of Israel's relationship with God, of which God is constantly having to go get her and bring her back. Go get her and bring her back, because the nation of Israel is having an adulterous relationship with other nations, depending on them instead of depending on God. And so he 
does it. He says, and I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know the Lord. And it will come about that in that day that I will respond, declares the Lord. <clears throat> I respond to the heavens and they will respond to the earth. And the earth will respond to the grain and to the new wine and to the oil. And they will respond to, to Jezreel. You remember the Jezreel Valley from our, from our Revelation study? What happens in the Valley of Jezreel? Almost all the battles, there have been more battles fought in the Battle of Jezreel than any other place in the whole world. It encompasses an area called the Valley of Jehoshaphat, also the Valley of Decision, also the Valley of Armageddon. That's what he's talking about here. And I will sow for myself in the land, and I will have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. And I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people. And they will say, thou art my God. In context, this passage in Hosea is talking about the thousand-year kingdom of the Lord when he comes to set it up. And when he comes to set it up, there will be people from all over the world who have not come to fight against God in that valley of decision. And they, when the battle is over and all the mess is cleaned up, as we study in that Revelation study, descendants from all the nations of the world will become His and worship Him every year as they come to see Lord Jesus Christ sitting on the throne. He says, in that place where the people who were not called my people, I will call them my people because they will be his people. All you Gentiles, all the Gentiles will become people. The Jews wanted just the Jews to be his people, but the Gentiles will also be their, his people. Verse 27. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sands of the seas, it is the remnant that will be saved, for the Lord will execute his word upon the earth thoroughly and quickly. Paul's going to Isaiah now. There, Isaiah chapter 10. He, it is there, he's talking about it. He's going to, the Syrian invasion is fixing to happen. And, and Isaiah is saying, look, only a remnant's going to last. Only a remnant. Not everybody's going to last in this. Only a remnant. Paul pulls that in, down into their time when he adds the next verse. Verse 29, he says, And just as Isaiah foretold, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left to us a posterity, we would have become as Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. The Lord of the Sabaoth, the Lord of Lords, he's talking about, unless he leaves a remnant and brings them on. Remember in the Revelation study where the saints are saying, how long, O Lord, how long, O Lord? If, we, if, if, this, if you don't bring an end to what's going on in this tribulation, no one will survive. Isaiah's talking about that in Isaiah chapter 1. He's talking about that. And he says, we're going to be like Sodom and or Gomorrah, talking to the Jews. Sodom and Gomorrah were horrible people, detestable people, ungodly people. And they didn't change their ways. Those two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah and three other cities, were all burnt up when fire and brimstone came down and they were nothing but a charred spot in the road at that point in time. And if, if God did not choose a remnant from Israel, Israel would turn up just like Sodom and Gomorrah if it wasn't for the Lord bringing the end to the time of their tribulation. And that's still in our future. Verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, attain righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of, right, of law of righteousness, did not arrive at the law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. Stop right there. Here we are, back in the first chapter of Romans. The, the people are without excuse because God has placed inside of them the innate ability to know the invisible attributes of God. And the Gentiles who receive righteousness simply by knowing the invisible attributes of God and following that, they receive righteousness. But the Jews, on the other hand, who are without excuse because they had the oracles of God and still didn't find the righteousness of God because they still didn't follow God, they had no excuse. Why? Because those Jews were doing it by works. They made 613 laws up to try to make it to God, which were not God's laws. He says in verse 33, said, They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Paul is quoting from three Isaiah passages that talk about the stone that is carved without hands, the stone that the Jews, the descendants of Israel, the descendants of Isaac, will stumble over when he gets there. 
and they will not accept the Messiah. Paul ends the chapter there, but I think it's a bad chapter break because of the context of what happens through ch- verse 4. Brethren, the word brethren always, rem- always refers to Jewish descent, Israel descent. My heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. He started off chapter 9 by saying, I would be accursed if my kinsmen would come to, to know the Lord. I would be accursed. He says, my heart's desire. He says, the Holy Spirit knows my heart. I would be accursed if they would come to them. My heart's desire is for their salvation. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. I'm telling you, they're zealous for God. All the Sanhedrin's, oh yeah, they're out there running. They got their laws and they're doing godly stuff and they're zealous for God but in a, not in accordance with knowledge. They haven't got God's knowledge. They haven't listened to the Lord. They haven't listened to the Messiah. They're out there being religious, but they're not righteous. Verse 3, For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own. Seeking to establish their own. These laws were all for a reason of the Jewish Sanhedrin to be able to control the people the way they wanted to control the people. Not God's way, but man's way. Jewish way. You catch it? Okay, And he says they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. They didn't subject themselves to God's laws. They subject themselves to their laws. They missed the mark. Why? Because Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ is the only place to go to find the righteousness. You get to the end of the law, the true law, not these laws, but the true laws, and you know the true laws, and they just show you your sins. How do you get to God and get righteousness? By putting your faith in the Messiah, the Christ, the Messiah who is to come, or the Messiah who came. Well, with that, we will pause for another week. Father, <laughs> Father, we love you. Father, we thank you for all. Father, may we never be people who act and try to do works to get to you. But Lord, our heart's desire is that we do what you want. We seek your will and that it is you who calls us righteous. That it doesn't matter what lump of clay we come from. It doesn't matter what job or responsibility you give us to do. If it's your will for us, we'll do it. We'll do the common things. We'll do the honorable things. If it is your will that we may serve you so that all things work together for good to those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Father, we ask all these things in your Son's name. Amen.